Let's pray together. O oh Lord, our God, our maker and sustainer, transcendent one, holy, powerful, infinitely big, holding the universe in the palm of your hand, measuring it by the span, naming all the stars, holding them all in place, sustaining our very lives with every breath that we take, every step we make. You are God and you are good and you are just and you are righteous and you are holy. And we, your creatures, have been in rebellion from birth. And you took on flesh and dwelt among us. To rescue us from ourselves, to rescue us from this world, to rescue us from Satan, to rescue us from sin and its consequences. And truly, Lord, to rescue us from you, from your just wrath against our sin, from your hostility against our hostility. To replace enmity with peace, to bring us to yourself. Only you could rescue us from you, and only you could rescue us unto you. And so we're mindful in this season celebrating your first advent, we are mindful of your second advent. You came once to suffer as a substitute in the place of sinners, you will come again as king to reign on your earth. We are yours. We ask now at the hearing of your word that you would be pleased to do in us what you desire. May your Holy Spirit wield this sharp two-edged sword in us for your glory and for our good. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Take out your Bibles this morning and turn to Revelation chapter 16. We continue our study of the second coming of Christ right into December, where we think much of the first coming of Christ. We'll be looking this morning at verses 17 through 21 of Revelation 16. I'm drawn to the invention of the wrecking ball. It's one of those inventions that is just fascinating to me. It first appeared somewhere in the late 1800s. A large stone ball, or later one made from forged steel, hung by a chain from a crane. And the design of the wrecking ball is to swing back and forth like a pendulum to smash buildings. Reducing tired buildings to rubble. And there's a certain sadness that comes with demolition, although, and this may speak more about the condition of my own heart, there's a certain satisfaction in bringing something to rubble. But you think about the sadness of demolition work, all of the details, all of the work, all of the creativity that goes into a structure. Think, for instance, about a, a very large size skyscraper that must come down. What a certain tragedy it is that all the ingenuity must be heaped into a pile of rubble, scrapped, thrown away. But sometimes demolition is necessary. When a large building is old and tired or unsafe, Perhaps when the building was not built to code and is unstable, filled with asbestos and black mold, the building must come down. What we read in our text this morning of God's word is the demolition of the earth. By the time this scene unfolds, still yet future to us, the world will be unstable the world will be polluted, and the world must come down. Read with me in our Bibles, Revelation 16, verses 17 to 21. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl upon the air, and a loud voice came out of the sanctuary from the throne, saying, It is done. 
And there were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. And there was a great earthquake, such as there had not been since man came to be on the earth. So great an earthquake was it, and so mighty. And the great city was split into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. Babylon the great was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the wrath of his rage. And every island fled away, and mountains were not found. And huge hailstones, about one talent each, came down from heaven upon men. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, because its plague was extremely severe. What is this passage all about? This is the seventh bold judgment, the last in a series of judgments, which is the last of three series of judgments. And when the seventh bold judgment occurs, God will dismantle the empire of Antichrist and the system of the world. What is this empire of Antichrist? What is the system of the world? I want you to think back for a moment, nearly to the beginning of human history. Post-flood, we have the Tower of Babel in the land of Nimrod, followed by the empire of Nebuchadnezzar. These are the lofty aspirations of humanity without God. All of these prefigure Babylon, the Babylon of the end times. This is humanity against God. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 10 to see truly where this Babylon begins. In verse 8 of Genesis 10, we read this Cush was the father of Nimrod. Nimrod began to be a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before Yahweh. Therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before Yahweh. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Erech and Akkad and the Kalna in the land of Shinar. From that land, he went out to Assyria and built Nineveh and Rehoboth Ir and Kalah. And you hear in those names some of the great and mighty warfaring empires of the ancient world. Assyria, the Akkadians, and of course the Babylonians, among others. Nimrod was the first to raise up armies and train armies for war. To take over other lands and to build empires. Of course, the land of Nimrod, the land of Ur, the land of the Chaldeans, the the Babylonians, became the empire of Nebuchadnezzar, who stood on his palace and said, look what I, Nebuchadnezzar, have built, who persecuted the people of God and exalted himself before the God of the world. All of these are emblems of the lofty aspirations of humanity without God, humanity against God. This empire building in the land of Shinar moves further in chapter 11 of Genesis. Look at verse 1. Now the whole earth had the same language and the same words, and it happened as they journeyed east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they settled there. They said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and tar for mortar. And they said, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven. And let us make for ourselves a name, lest we be scattered over the face of the whole earth. And just pause right there. What was humanity? made in God's image, designed to do, with Yahweh's imprint on them, fill the earth, scatter abroad the whole globe, and subdue the earth, fill the earth with God's good rule as image bearers of God. They said, we will not do it God's way. We're actually going to get together and make a name for ourselves. Forget God. Then Yahweh, notice this in verse 5, came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. Uh, Yahweh had to stoop infinitely low to see their lofty tower. 
And Yahweh said, Behold, they are one people, they all have the same language, and this is what they have begun to do. So now nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible for them. Let us go down there and confuse their language, so that they will not understand one another's language. So Yahweh scattered them from there over the face of the whole earth, and they stopped building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because there Yahweh confused the language of the whole earth, and from there Yahweh scattered them over the face of the whole earth. A couple of interesting features about this scene. Notice in verse 8, Yahweh scattered them, and therefore they stopped building the city. Where did Yahweh scatter them? Over the face of the whole earth. Now, I don't believe this is patterned migrations. I believe that Yahweh supernaturally forced humanity to be scattered. They refused to do it on their own. And he judged them by giving them separate languages and moving them across the globe. And what the people had built at the Tower of Babel, we, we might think of a tower as something like an obelisk. But more likely, it was the ancient building structure of the ziggurat. You can think pyramid, wide at the base, narrowing as it gets to the top. And what's fascinating about humanity here is, though they were judged by God in their language and judged by God in their geography, they did not repent. In fact, you can go all over the world today and find more of these towers. What did humanity do when they scattered across the earth? The Mayans, the Aztecs, the Inca, the Egyptians, the Mesopotamians, the Chavan people of Colombia, the Nubians in Sudan, more recently the Romans near in the time of Christ, and even Herod the Great built his own as a monument to himself. These towers all over the world as a recalcitrant, unrepentant resistance to God and his ways. Uh, these are monuments to human rebellion. And, and the pattern at the Tower of Babel became the pattern of the Babylonian Empire, which becomes the pattern of the final world system that the book of Revelation calls Babylon. And in between, a train of human societies and civilizations have followed the pattern. To bring humanity and human resources together without God to build monuments to their own greatness. Humanity to make a name for itself. And all of this culminates in the end times Babylon. A political, religious, and economic system that encompasses the whole world with Antichrist at the helm. The hearts of humanity in league together in a proud plot to be great without God, to make a name for themselves, and a name for themselves they will have. What will that name be? In the end, they will all bear the name of that tyrant, the beast, branded by the great deceiver as a satanic mockery of humanity's purpose. You wanted a name for yourself? 666. The number and the name of the beast and what will humanity say at that time? Look how free we are. We're so free from God and his ways. Well, they march around tattooed with the number of his name. Slaves of the darkness, irretrievably doomed to eternal ruin. Empires have come and gone throughout world history, rising up and eventually being reduced to rubble. They are replaced and recycled. The remains of their towers the remains of their monuments to self-aggrandizement become the curious relics in our museums. It's not just civilizations that do this thing, this Tower of Babel to Babylon enterprise. We individuals do this. We build our own personal towers of Babel. Anytime a, a human rejects God's claim on his life, seeks to make something of himself without God, just as God came down in Genesis 11 to see the lofty tower of Babel, God stoops infinitely low to see our proud piles. And listen, until you belong to God through Jesus Christ, everything you build in life will be fodder for the wrecking ball. Build it as tall as you like, build it as strong as you like, it will come crashing down in the end. That takes us to this scene at the seventh bold judgment of God in Revelation 16. 
where God finishes out his judgments against a rebellious world. We'll look at three features of this dismantling of the empire. The first feature is the rumbling of heaven. Look down at verse 17. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl upon the air, and a loud voice came out of the sanctuary from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. So far, we have seen judgments on the sea, on the fresh waters, and on the sun. And now this seventh and last bowl judgment is poured out on the atmosphere of the earth. This last catastrophe will encompass the globe and its inhabitants in a global disaster, the likes of which the world has never known. Seven times the word great is used of this judgment. This is the final climax of God's judgments against the world. This is the great and terrible day of Yahweh. This statement that the seventh angel poured out his bowl and the saying from heaven follows. The saying from heaven is very straightforward, very simple. A loud voice came out of the temple from the throne. This is the voice of God. Look back at chapter 15 and verse 8. You remember the sanctuary was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no one was able to enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. So God is alone in his temple. None of the four living beings, none of the angels, none of the myriads of saints gathered there. Let me alone, God says. Smoke fills the temple and his wrath is ready. And so out of that temple comes a voice. It is clearly God's voice. Heaven has given him room and the voice proclaims, it is done. This is an ominous pronouncement. It's a statement of finality because this judgment brings to an end the course of this world which has so long languished under the rule of Satan, under the lies of Satan, the one who is called the God of this world. It is done means that the series of judgments that started all the way back in Revelation 6 have reached their conclusion. It is done means that the time has run out on humanity's best efforts to make something of itself apart from God. It is done means that time is up. Opportunity is lost. And all that remains now is justice and fairness and the righting of all wrongs. All that's left is the bringing in of God's peace by the destruction of those who would not yield to his grace. The world rejected the declaration, it is finished, from the Savior's lips at the cross of Calvary. So they must now suffer the pronouncement, it is done, from the judge's voice out of the throne of heaven. This coming future day is more certain than tomorrow's sunrise. God has long been patient with a rebellious world, and the day will come when his patience will be through. After this very straightforward statement, we have an unsettling storm. Look down at verse 18. There were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. Turn back to chapter 4 of Revelation. This is no doubt a familiar refrain to us now. Revelation 4, 5 records this. Out of the throne come flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. That heavenly disturbance was seen by the Apostle John before the beginning of the seal judgments. Turn to chapter 8 and verse 3. An angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer and much incense was given to him so that he might add to it the prayers of all the saints of the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the incense went up with the prayers of the saints out of the angel's hand before God. And the angel took the censer and filled it with the fire of the altar and threw it to the earth. And there followed peals of thunder and sounds and flashes of lightning and an earthquake. That preceded the unfolding of the trumpet judgments. And then in chapter 11, verse 19... We read, the sanctuary of God, which is in heaven, was opened. The ark of his covenant appeared in the sanctuary. There were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder and an earthquake and a great hailstorm. 
And all of this occurs before the bowl judgments begin. And now as the last bowl judgment is being poured out on the earth, heaven is a storm again. What will happen when this last bowl goes forward? Heaven will rumble. There's a second feature of the dismantling of Antichrist's empire and the world system. It is the shaking of the earth. We see this in verse 18. Look at the second half of that verse. There was a great earthquake, such as there had not been since man came upon the earth. So great an earthquake was it, and so mighty. I grew up with earthquakes. As a kid living in Alaska, earthquakes seemed to be a regular occurrence. They were kind of fun for a few seconds, exhilarating, adrenalizing, and then terrifying. And the earthquakes I experienced, furniture danced around. Uh, in the front yard one time, I was knocked to the ground. But they were mild. They were small. Not massively destructive. In 1964, Alaska was hit with a very large earthquake. Uh, the remnants of that earthquake can still be seen today in places where the, the ground was separated by nearby portions of the ground by 8 to 10 feet a whole floor of the hospital in downtown Anchorage was collapsed. And you enter the hospital on floor two now. What will it be like when the earth will shake more than it has ever shaken since man has been on the earth? It will not be a localized earthquake. It will not be a regional earthquake. It will not be one fault line, but one collision of continents. The whole earth will tremble. The whole earth will heave violently. A technical footnote here in verse 18. I want you to notice a detail. The earthquake described here is not, not called the greatest earthquake there has ever been. Nor does it say this is the, the greatest shaking of the earth since the beginning of creation. What does the text tell us? It was a great earthquake such as there had not been since man came to be on the earth. When did man arrive on the earth, the sixth day, the sixth day of creation. Now, granted, it, it's less than a week since the universe began, and yet the technical detail is interesting. Think about what Genesis 1 9 says when God spoke these words let dry land appear. Have you ever wondered what that looked like and sounded like? <laughs> what kind of shaking of the earth would take place for dry land to appear out of the waters? In fact, geologists discover the, the scouring runoff of that geological event even to this day. So there must have been massive seismic upheaval prior to day six of creation. That'll be helpful for us to understand the purpose of this shaking in a few moments. But this end times earthquake will be the most violent, most extensive, and most destructive earthquake any human will have ever experienced. It is a fulfillment of Haggai 2.6. Thus says Yahweh of hosts, once more, in a little while, I am going to shake the heavens and the earth, the sea also, and the dry land. It's a fulfillment of Hebrews 12, 25 to 27. Here's a warning on the basis of this future event. See to it, the writer to Hebrews says, that you do not refuse God who is speaking. For if those who did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape who turn away from him who warns from heaven. And his voice shook the earth then, but now he has promised saying, yet once more I will shake not only the earth but also the heaven. This expression, yet once more, denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken, created things so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. This warning is really helpful for us. God is going to shake the earth in such a way as to reshape it fundamentally. 
And yet the promise is you can build things that outlast that shaking. You can build things that endure. So if, if you will suffer with me for a moment for a sermon within the sermon, I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. If you thought that listening to a sermon was suffering enough, an embedded sermon within the sermon is double. The Apostle Paul here in 1 Corinthians 3 is writing to the church at Corinth and he's instructing believers how to conduct themselves in the church, the gospel mission to the ends of the earth, in the way they go about God's business. This is for every believer. And he writes, each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. We are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. According to the grace of God, which was given to me like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation. Another is building on it, but each man must be careful how he builds on it. No one can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident, for the day will indicate it, because it is to be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive reward. But if any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Do you not know that y'all, you plural, are a sanctuary of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? In the New Testament era, the temple is us, believers, being built up together in the great enterprise of the Great Commission that began in Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and goes to the ends of the earth. In Tempe, Arizona, we are on that trajectory of the gospel going out through God's institution, the church, to the ends of the earth, to the ends of this age. This is what we are to be about, all of us believers together. And how we go about that business matters to God. There are things you can build with which will not endure the scrutiny of Jesus' assessment. It'll be burned up. And, and thankfully so. The wood, hay, straw, the, the sorry motives, the mixed motives, the, the impure things, the, the wasted time, the, the squandered opportunities. We don't want any of that in heaven. We don't want that to last. Jesus will burn it up at the Bema Seat Judgment. But when you and I build with things that the Holy Spirit produces in us, bringing about real spiritual fruit and the building up of the body of Christ until he comes, we are building on things that last. And as the author to Hebrews just informed us, things that can never be shaken, though the universe is shaken by the judgment of God in the last days. Just an encouragement for us. When we labor for Christ in this world, we're laboring for things that last. When you labor not for Christ in this world, you are adding details and artwork and furniture and, and construction ingenuity and blood, sweat, and tears and financial resources to things that God will take a wrecking ball to. It will all come down. Notice the effects of this last day's earthquake. Look at verse 19. And the great city was split into three parts. The great city, according to chapter 11, verse 8, is Jerusalem. Jerusalem will be split into three parts. And notice by contrast in verse 19, the cities of the nations fell. All the world's cities reduced to rubble on the spot in a moment. By the way, that contrast is important. God is protecting Jerusalem, preserving Jerusalem. He has a plan for Jerusalem. He will level the cities of the world. Especially Babylon, the capital city of Antichrist's empire. God says Babylon the Great was remembered before God to take the cup of of the wine, of the wrath, of his rage. 
We will look more at the cup of the wine of the wrath of God's rage against Babylon in the coming chapters. Chapter 17, 18, 19, all detail the, the history of Babylon, the nature of Babylon, and the destruction of Babylon, and the rejoicing of heaven at the destruction of Babylon. That's all coming. In fact, if you look at chapter 17, verse 1, we read, Then one of the seven angels who have the seven bowls came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. And we have sort of a, a long extended footnote on Babylon. Uh, we'll spend some weeks studying that footnote. The chronology picks up again in the middle of chapter 19. Look at verse 20. This is another effect of this shaking of the earth. Every island fled. The word fled there is where we get our English word fugitive, just running away. Islands running away, being moved from their places. What kind of geographical seismic activity, what kind of violence in the earth must be happening for islands to be removed from their places? And notice the next phrase, mountains were not found. Entire mountains come crumbling down to flatness. By the way, my English Bible says the mountains were not found, making it sound like there are no more mountains anymore. The word the is not in the Greek text. Uh, my suggestion would be to cross it out. There are a couple English versions that just say mountains were no more. The idea there is certain mountains or some mountains came completely down. All the islands were removed from their place and some mountains were flattened too. This is a remarkably violent event. God is demolishing the present world, including its topography, in judgment of the earth dwellers, but also in preparation for his son's kingdom, for Messiah's kingdom. Listen to Zechariah 14. In that day, his feet, that is Yahweh's feet, Yahweh in the flesh, the Son, Jesus the Messiah, will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in front of Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives will be split in its middle from east to west by a very large valley, so that half of the mountain will move toward the north and the other half to the south. And in that day, living waters will flow out of Jerusalem, half of them towards the eastern sea, half towards the western sea, and it will be in summer as well in winter. Think about this promise. A change in topography. The Mount of Olives just next to the hill where Jerusalem is split in half. The whole hill of Jerusalem split in three parts by this great earthquake. And what follows... Do I need to switch? Okay. of what is now the Dead Sea and flowing out to the Mediterranean Sea, turning the Dead Sea into fresh water, making the whole place like the Garden of Eden. That is the Old Testament promise about this event. And what Revelation details for us is the massive seismic activity that brings about this topographical change. And then Zechariah tells us, and Yahweh will be king over all the earth. In that day, Yahweh will be the only one and his name the only one. And all the land will be changed into a plain from Geba to Rimmon, south of Jerusalem. But Jerusalem will rise and remain on its site from Benjamin's gate, as far as the place of the first gate to the corner gate, from the tower of Hananel to the king's wine presses. God is preparing the ground, preparing the land, preparing the earth for the kingdom of Jesus with Jerusalem as the capital city. Jerusalem will have a central role, and this is even reflected in the topography. Listen to Isaiah 2. It will come about in the last days, the mountain of the house of Yahweh will be established as the chief of the mountains. It will be raised above the hills, and all the nations will stream to it, and many people will come, and they will say, come, let us go up to the mountain of Yahweh, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. 
For the law will go forth from Zion and the word of Yahweh from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations. He will render decisions for many peoples and they will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation and never again will they learn war. The art of war was first taught by Nimrod in the plain of Shinar when he built all of these empires to war against one another. It has not been a lost art on humanity, but has continued and will continue with wars and rumors of wars up until this time when God will judge the earth dwellers with one last judgment. And that last judgment will reshape the earth so that Jerusalem as capital of his son's kingdom will reign. There's a third feature of the dismantling of the empire of Antichrist, which makes way for the kingdom of Messiah. And it is the bombardment of the earth dwellers. Look down at verse 21. And huge hailstones about one talent each came down from heaven upon men and men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, because its plague was extremely severe. This is the shelling of the people on the earth by God's artillery. A talent somewhere between 108 and 130 pounds. I'm going to give you some homework for this afternoon. Go home and find something that weighs about 100 pounds and lift it. And then throw it up onto your kitchen table and see what happens. Or better yet... Get it about 50 feet above your house and drop it and see what it does even to a concrete tile roof. The largest modern hailstone on record was measured in the United States in 2010 in Vivian, South Dakota. This is not an advertisement to not move to South Dakota. But that hailstone weighed 1.9 pounds. It's massive. Think about 100-pound hailstones and what they would do to animals and to people and to structures. The cannonball is fascinating. Cannonballs have been launched and shot at boats and people and forts throughout history. In the 16th century, the cannonball was used for fortress destruction, and the average weight of a cannonball was six to eight pounds, blasting through stone walls. In the 17th century, the cannon was used in naval warfare, and the cannonballs ranged from 12 to 24 pounds to blast boats and forts. And in the 19th century, the cannonballs were used for field combat combat and And could range anywhere up to 42 pounds. Try a hundred pound cannonball hurtling towards the ground at terminal velocity. This would produce terror and chaos and demolition of an unprecedented scale. And remember, the earth will just have faced the worst earthquake that humanity had ever experienced. What do people do during earthquakes? What did you do the last time you experienced an earthquake? You run outside. I'm not safe in here with the bookshelves and the china cabinets and all the glass. You run out to the middle of the street, to the middle of a field, somewhere where things won't fall on you. Humanity will be afraid to go indoors. This was significant for the churches in Asia Minor to whom John was writing, plagued by earthquakes time and time again. Some of their cities had been rebuilt and people actually lived in tents for decades after a severe earthquake, afraid to go inside. And now all of humanity, afraid to go indoors, exposed outdoors when the great hailstones of this last judgment fall. This will be a severe plague. When the great hailstones fell on the land of Egypt during the Exodus, Pharaoh relented. He confessed his sins. He called Moses in and asked Moses to pray to God on his behalf. What will the earth dwellers do under this final climactic judgment of God? Look down at the text. 
And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, because its plague was extremely severe. Just as they blasphemed Christ at the cross, as Jacob read earlier, they will blaspheme God while under his judgment in this plague of hail. It's the same hard-hearted response that we've seen before in the book of Revelation. And it reminds us that there is no neutrality. There is only hostility or love, spiritually speaking. There is only God's way and every other way. There are only two sides in this battle that is waged since the fall of man. And those who have not relented, who have not turned to God, who have not appealed to his heart of love in the gospel, are at enmity with him, in hostility with him. And in our day, this spiritual hostility is regularly dressed up. It is niced up. It is civilized. It's got its makeup on and its hair done. But in the end, humanity's rejection of God will be out in the open. It will be seen for what it has always been. A war against God in the heart. A battle for self-exaltation. For idolatry. It will be the all-out defense of self-love at all costs. Paul wrote to Timothy that in the end, men will be lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Self-willed, self-righteous. It is the grace of God to inform us now about what will happen in the future. Are you listening? You can't stop the wrath from coming. Here's what the prophet Isaiah said. Even from eternity, I am Yahweh. There is none who can deliver out of my hand. I act and who could reverse it. There is no stopping this irresistible cannonball hurtling towards the earth. Daniel said the the Messiah's reign would come like a stone cut without hands from heaven to smash all of the humanities, empires and civilizations and governments in one fell swoop. Turn them to powder to be blown away like chaff. It's coming. You cannot stop the wrath, but you can't escape it. If you're hearing these words today, it is a measure of God's kindness to you. That there is a means of escape from the wrath that is to come. And there is only one way. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth and I am the life. If you do not have Jesus, you do not have his father. If you do not have the love of God through the gospel of Jesus Christ, you do not have God's love. And our sentimental world talks about being loved by God when they are under his wrath. The reality is time is running out on this world. God has made his love known through his son who came to earth and died on a cross to pay for the sins of everyone who would ever believe. If you recognize your own sins, you recognize your need of a savior, you can be saved by calling out to him, even this day. And if you refuse his love, if you refuse the salvation he offers, you will not escape the wrath that is coming. I'm struck by the very simple statement back in verse 17. Look there again for a moment. In these rumblings of heaven at the beginning of this outpouring judgment, the voice out of the sanctuary from the throne says, it is done. There are four such statements in our Bibles. Pronouncements from God at the conclusion of monumental acts of his power. One of them occurs at the creation. Genesis 131 concludes with, it was very good. God's assessment after creation week, after calling light into existence, after calling the universe into existence by his very word, after putting all the details into the heavens and the earth and the sea, and then placing man in his image on the earth. After doing all of that, God said, it is very good. And of course, man's rebellion begins in the next scene. 
and it is no longer very good. In fact, God's assessment of humanity is there is no one good, not even one. But there's another statement at the end of a monumental work, and it comes at the cross. You remember Jesus hung in midair between heaven and earth as our sacrificial lamb, our substitute sacrifice for sin. God placed him there and placed his wrath upon him. And when Jesus had absorbed infinite quantities of divine wrath against our crimes, when he had paid for our sins at the cross, he took enough liquid on his parched lips to utter loudly one last cry. It is finished, he said. What was finished? The work required for redemption so that there would be no condemnation for those who believe in Christ. The third statement is this one we find in our text this morning in Revelation 16. At the conclusion of this age we are now in, at the seventh bold judgment, the final outpouring of wrath in the last days of this age, God says it is done. He brings with his power the judgment that is due to the earth. And he makes this simple statement again. There is a fourth, another statement like this. It occurs in Revelation 21. And that one happens at the conclusion of the next age. After the glorious thousand year reign of Christ on this present earth. God will fold up the present universe. Peter says it will burn at the, end, at the elemental level and be no more. In Revelation 20, we discovered that the universe flees before the great white throne of Jesus at the final judgment. And what comes in its place, a new heavens and new earth. Look down at verse 1 of chapter 21. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, that is a new universe. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there's no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men. He will dwell among them and they shall be his people and God himself will be among them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will no longer be any death, no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things passed away. Everything in your Bible from Revelation, or Genesis 1 through Revelation 20, everything you and I have ever experienced, most of what we've talked about in the book of Revelation so far will all fall under the banner of the first things that when Revelation 21 happens, go away, along with death and pain and sadness. And look at verse 5. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Right, these words are faithful and true. And then he said to me, and here's this phrase again, They are done. They are done. That is, the bringing in of the new heavens and the new earth, the replacement of the old, the end of the curse, the end of death, the end of sin, all of it finished. That next age, the one that never ends, will be a continuation of the glorious visible reign of God on this earth. God's special dwelling place, heaven, where the new Jerusalem is being constructed by Jesus even now, that remains, that endures. Everything that believers build in this life for the glory of God by the power of the Spirit, that endures. But everything in the heavens and the earth, that is the physical universe, goes away and is replaced seemingly instantaneously 
perhaps in a day rather than six days. A new universe where it would be impossible for you and I who love God to ever fail at loving God. It will be impossible for us to have a stray thought or any disloyalty. It will be impossible for us to do anything but give God the glory he is due and to enjoy it forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. That is what we have to look forward to. The gospel of Jesus Christ, his death in our place at the cross, makes it possible, actual, future history for all who believe. But there's a demolition coming first. And this world in its rebellion against God will not survive it. Do you belong to Jesus? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the way you have written history from beginning to the end. You are the Alpha and the Omega. From you and through you and to you are all things. To you be the glory forever. Oh Lord Jesus, would you disattach us from this world which is perishing? Would you let us be in it but not of it? Would you help us to use its resources for eternal things, time, opportunities, finances? Would you help us to see our relationships to the mortals on this earth as a company of immortals, those who will live forever, either under your infinite fury or in your glorious presence in infinite joy? We pray to see people this way. We pray that you would make us your faithful ambassadors to preach the gospel until you take us home. It's in Jesus' name we pray it. Amen.